Welcome. I'm Sabine Sparwasser, German ambassador in Canada, and I thank you for joining Terra Incognita, mapping the 21st century in Canada, in Germany, and in the world. How to make sense, how to survive and build better in this age of turmoil and huge uncertainty um, is our big question of the day. Um, and we picked a fine day um, to discuss about that. We have the midterms in the US. We have um, a very uncertain situation and anxiety about the aggression of Russia against Ukraine. We have COP going on at this moment and the fear that the 1.5 degree um, target is going to be uh, not achievable anymore. And the pandemic is far from over. So all of that very scary. We live in a time of geopolitical competition and tensions. And in our countries, polarization is a threat to democracies. At the same time, we see technological revolution at incredible speed, changing the world and the work and the life around us. So we desperately need to make sense out of this world. We need to find direction identify the levers to stop the cascades of interrelated crisis. The temptations for simple solutions, um, temptations like my country first, are very easy, but they are to be resisted. We as nations need to accept complexity, understand our world better, understand the dynamics uh, that shape us better. And what we also need is to inject a dose of optimism and can-do spirits. And this book, A Hundred Maps to Survive the Next Hundred Years, does that ju just that. Robert Muga and Ian Golden's book has been sitting on my coffee table for over a year. It was written before the Ukraine war, but it's been sitting on my coffee table and been looked at a lot. Um, because it does give you a lot of answers and it helps you um, uh, to find a lot of insights on how to address the world we live in. I am very grateful to have both of them here to talk to us today. I'm also super grateful to Doug Saunders, the Canadian international affairs columnist and a good friend also of Germany and also who's been in Berlin a few years ago. And I wanted to thank, as always, the Monk School and Alexander Reisenbichler um, for having allowed us to set up this uh, event today um, to talk about. Um, before I hand over to Alexander directly, allow me just one last word, a little uh, like a little commercial. This is also our celebration of one year uh, anniversary of the German-Canadian Herzberg Network. We created this network a year um, ago as a link between academics, between researchers and scientists. Uh, we wanted to establish a community, a community you in the end will be crucial to help us find and translate the solutions for the next hundred years. So I encourage everybody to join. And now I hand over to Alexander. Um, good morning, everyone, and thank you very much, Ambassador Sparwasser. My name is Alexander Reisenbichler, and I direct the Joint Initiative in German and European Studies here at the University of Toronto's Center for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies. But before we begin, I wish to acknowledge that for thousands of years, the land on which we, the University of Toronto, operate has been the traditional land of the Euron Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Now, I'd like to first thank the German Embassy and Ambassador Sparwasser, who has, of course, been Germany's ambassador to Canada since 2017, for their unfailing support. We have worked both with the German Embassy in Ottawa and the German Consulate in Toronto, and indeed the ambassador herself for over 15 years. And today's event is one of a series of signature webinars on German politics, which um, have previously included events on German reunification 
and on the legacy of Chancellor Angela Merkel. These events have been exemplary and today's webinar promises to be no different. On behalf of our center, I'd like to join Ambassador Spavas in welcoming all of you here for a, discussion on an, for a discussion on an outstanding book written by Ian Golden and Robert Maga called Terra Incognita, 100 Maps to Survive the Next 100 Years. We're of course very delighted to have both authors with us here today. And the book is a tour de force of the most important developments of our time, including economic inequality, rapid technological change, migration, violent conflict, and climate change. And the authors do so with images and maps that are powerful, beautiful, and at times dispiriting. They highlight sweeping global trajectories over the last years, decades, and even centuries. And they make a series of powerful predictions about future economic, social, political, and, envir and, and environmental trends. Today, the authors will share some of their key findings with an eye to Germany, Canada, and the rest of the world. And we could not have picked a better moderator for today's event. We're very grateful to Doug Saunders for moderating our discussion today. As many of you will know, Doug is an award-winning journalist and author, and he is currently the Globe and Mail's international affairs columnist, and has previously held posts with the newspaper in LA and London. For his journalistic work, Doug received the National Newspaper Award, which is Canada's equivalent to the Pulitzer Prize, on five separate occasions, as well as the Stanley McDowell Prize for writing. Doug also published three best-selling books, such as Arrival City that details the rise of rural to urban migration. His second book, The Myth of the Muslim Tide, effectively challenges the hysterical and Islamophobic Arabia literature. And his third book, Maximum Canada, makes a bold appeal for an outward-looking Canada of 100 million people. Um, like his journalistic writings, his books received numerous awards, including the Donner Prize for the best book on politics, and a runner-up spot for the Monk School's Gelber Prize for the world's best international affairs book. Doug was also a Richard von Weizsäcker Fellow at the Robert Bosch Academy in Berlin. And finally, on a personal note, Doug, I was pleased to see that your research took you to the neighborhood I grew up in, Leipzig-Grünau, a Plattenbau neighborhood, which is, in many ways, on no one's map to stick with today's theme. With that, let me hand, it, let me hand the floor to Doug Saunders. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, uh... Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Reisenbichler uh, and Ambassador Sparwasser for, for, for putting this together and making it possible. And thank you especially to uh, Rob and Ian for giving up your time and, and for making this book uh, a reality. It was, it's a, it's a, a massive effort of research and, and, and organization, and, and I, I would call it one of the great triumphs of data visualization of our time. But that makes it sound a little too boring. In fact, I when I realized I was going to be hosting this, uh, I had to spend a couple of days trying to figure out where, where my copy of, of this book was located because so many people had borrowed it and got lost in it. This is a, this is a work you get lost in. It, uh, it, it, uh, it contains so many fascinating visuals and maps and illustrations, yet also manages to be a very comprehensive essay um, that, that you look you learn from these these points. Uh, if if I if I could summarize what you get from it, uh, as they as the authors say, it 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 offers maps to explain some of our gravest existential challenges and a few of the most inspiring solutions. You will you will learn from it about progress, you will learn from it about the, the rise of international interconnectedness and uh, the decline of, of poverty, the increase in longevity and these things. You will also learn about the, uh, the devastation to the climate, to, uh, to, to international relations, um, and, and quite a number of other looming threats. Um, the book, I would say, is a, is a cry for using this interconnectedness to cooperative greater ends. Uh, as, as the authors say, it's a cry for cooperative risk management. The greatest problem we face, as they note in their conclusion, is the short-termism of governments that are not addressing systemic risks and failing to cooperate 
to resolve them. And I'm going to let the authors speak about that. So uh, Ian Golden is Oxford University's Professor of Globalization and Development and a founding director of the Oxford Martin School. He was, he's was he been an advisor to Nelson Mandela. He led the Development Bank of Southern Africa before becoming a vice president of the World Bank. Uh, he's the author of 22 books, three BBC series, um, and uh, he's been knighted by the French government for services to development. Uh, and and I, could, I could go on, but I'll allow them to speak about the concert, uh, context. Robert Muga is globally recognized thought leader, speaker, and writer on issues of security, migration, cities, and new technologies. He's the co-founder of two uh, important think tanks, the uh, Igarape Institute in, in Brazil and the SecDev Group in, in Canada. The former is uh, what, they, what he calls a think and do tank. Um, focused on things like climate solutions, and SecDev is uh, focused on digital risk and cybersecurity, and he does a lot of work in the in the uh, climate and sustainability space, in the security space, and and things like that. Again, I think the authors are best equipped to explain their own context. And really, I think the best way to to talk about this book is to allow them to show some of the extraordinary data visualizations and images. That they've put together and talk about the lessons uh, we can draw from it. So let me let me turn this session over to uh, Robert Muga and Ian Golden, and uh, we'll have a dialogue at the end, and we'll allow questions from those of you attending. So please do uh, please do post any questions you may have in the Q and A uh, uh, box, and hopefully I'll be able to get as many uh, attendee questions as possible to the authors at the end of this. So uh, Rob and Ian, the floor is yours. Great, Th thanks so much uh, to, to you, Doug, and, and to Alexander and Ambassador Sparwasser for the generous introduction and setting in a way the stage. Um, and a special thanks, I think, broadly to the German Embassy and Monk, uh, in particular, Scylla, Elena, Klaus, Daria, Alexander, and others who were involved in helping set this up. Um, just as a, a footnote before I start, the book is available in German. It's called Atlas of the Future, uh, as well as in six or seven other languages right now with more on the way. So over the next 20 to 25 minutes, with the help uh, of some visuals that I think will go on the screen shortly, um, Ian and I are going to divide our reflections uh, really into two parts. I'm going to touch on uh, some of the high-level risks and introduce the book. Um, Ian then is going to plunge into some of the megatrends from the book itself uh, with an eye on talking about some of those intersections, uh, some of those interdependencies, as well as hopefully some of the solutions. It's not all doom and gloom, uh, but I have to say that there are some pretty heavy and dark shadows uh, that, that uh, pervade the book. Um, and then the idea, I think, is to head back to you, Doug, and, and uh, have a, a Q&A and, and some discussion with the audience. So why don't we go to the first slide? And I'm going to start with the obvious. Um, and as the ambassador said, and Doug, as you hinted at, uh, we are in interesting times. We're at the tail end, one could, could say, or certainly in the midst of being rattled by a pandemic, a, a pandemic that killed uh, at least 6 million people, making it one of the worst uh, pandemics in known human history. We're in the midst of a what you could describe as a global war, the first global war in, in 75 years. Uh, and we are facing the, the, the future of U.S. democracy hanging in the balance. And I, I think it's safe to say that we're all feeling a bit rattled by uncertainty right now. Uh, and I think the truth is, is, is that the world is undergoing a profound transformation and, and historic shifts, such as the one that we're going through now, inevitably generate unpredictability and un unease. On the one hand, we're experiencing geopolitical shocks with implications for everything from international peace and security to energy security. And on the other hand, we're facing uh, climate change that's accelerating more frequent and intense stresses, uh, and that is the focus, as the ambassador mentioned, of COP27 uh, meetings that are underway right now in Egypt. And along the way, we're facing a whole series of disruptions, like new viruses, both online and offline, and cyber attacks with cascading and compounding effects. So Ian and I want to walk through some of these intersecting shocks that are contributing to this collective sense of anxiety, dread, and unease. And I think we also want to highlight a few of the megatrends that will shape uh, our future. And this really is the goal of this book, in a way, which was to clarify some aspects of the predicament that we currently find ourselves in. But more than that, to think about ways to, to inspire action. 
So next slide, please. I think a key point here is that there's, there's really no way to sugarcoat our global predicament right now. We're facing an extraordinarily challenging moment. Top of mind for many of us in this call, uh, I'm sure, are escalating nuclear threats, coming as they do almost exactly uh, 60 years after the Cuban Missile Crisis of October 1962. Uh, we have Russia and NATO that are saber-rattling on the one side, but also a hyperactive North Korea ramping up pressure in Asia, uh, and not to mention challenges in Iran. And according to our forecasts, uh, the risks of a nuclear exchange are low, but still nevertheless rising. Um, and there on top of that, there are concerns of, of militarization of existing nuclear powers, notably China, the proliferation of nuclear arms beyond the nine countries already known to have them, and more. Next slide, please. We're also experiencing the early stages of a global climate emergency, uh, what many call this era of the Anthropocene. And as all of you know, the past decade was the hottest on record. Uh, this year, we experienced record smashing heat waves across the Americas, Europe, Africa, Asia, and the three poles, the Arctic, the Antarctic, and the often forgotten Himalayas. Faced with all this doom and gloom, you might feel tempted, I think many of us might feel tempted to retreat to the warm, warm comforts uh, of happy denial. Uh, and while starting a flower shop, or Lord forbid, as some uh, billionaires are prone to do, retreating to a bunker may all sound tempting. I think one of the key messages of Terra Incognita is that uh, that would be precisely the wrong thing to do. Because more than at any other time in our history, the decisions that we make over the next decade will influence the future of our species and our planet. And so I guess the question that we were left with in writing the book was, are there grounds in the midst of all of these challenges for stubborn optimism? And I think the answer that we have is an emphatic yes. And one of the reasons we feel that that's the case is because during these periods of great power transition and realignment, precisely like the ones that we're experiencing today, there are opportunities to redesign our global, national, local systems, if only that we seize them. Next slide, please. One, one tool that we feel can help us recognize or at least begin to think about these opportunities and potentially make smarter, more enlightened, more informed decisions is this humble map. Maps cut through the noise. They help offer insights into our past, our present, and our future. They can communicate vast troves of information and data in an instant. Next slide. Maps are also the starring actors in Terra Incognita, the book that we're here to talk about. And it turns out that we are literally hardwired for maps. They appeal to our enlarged cerebral cortex, which controls sight, speech, thought, and memory. There really is a science behind that old marketing adage that a picture is worth a thousand words. Next slide, please. But here's the thing. Maps aren't static or fixed. They need to be regularly updated with fresh evidence. And we cite in the beginning of the book, Albert Einstein, who said, you can't use maps to explore a new world. And we find that maps have changed over time. As all of you know, map making is this deeply ingrained ancient impulse. Long before we stamped letters on parchment or dipped our quills in inkwells, we were scratching images about local food sources onto the waves, onto the walls of caves. Next slide, please. And over time, we graduated our map making to stone tablets. One of the first known maps, world maps, was Imago Mundi, which you see here, created over 2,500 years ago in Babylon, what is Iraq today. For the next couple of thousand years, cartographers helped locate humans relative to one another, to faraway lands, and even to the stars. They helped make sense of the world around us. Next slide, please. And here's an even more influential map, which is called Geographia, produced by the Greek astronomer, geographer, and mathematician Ptolemy in 150 AD. With its latitude and longitudinal lines, this map really set the stage for most that followed. Since Ptolemy, we've seen a steady evolution of maps from faraway lands ringed by strange and terrifying beasts uh, to detailed geological landscapes that are shaping uh, and continue to shape the modern world. By documenting our surroundings, maps have enabled new connections to be made, new innovations to be dreamed up, new inventions that gave rise uh, to civilizations. Next map. Today, we are hyper-dependent on maps in such a way that we almost aren't even aware of it. Uh, in, in, in terms of charting our, our, our human, our environmental, and even our cosmological conditions. We've got macroscopic maps, satellites and telescopes charting galaxies, 
And I'm currently working with a number of these satellite companies that are developing low orbital satellites that give us a 24 seven view of the world. And we've got microscopic maps that map the genetic composition of viruses and disease. And with the click of a button, we can fan out from the cellular to the celestial scale increasingly in real time. And I think one of the stories that we, Ian and I discovered in writing this book is that maps are not just informative, they're also potentially quite empowering. Next slide, please. But before I hand over to Ian to describe some of the megatrends from Terra Incognita, I just wanna first run through uh, some of the big shocks that we're facing and, and how maps can help illuminate them. I argue uh, that there are about five, at least five, simultaneous shocks that are occurring at different speeds, and any one of them can overwhelm us. Mapping them, I think, is the first step to mitigation. The first and most obvious shock, I think, that the ambassador alluded to in the very beginning is, of this session is the Russian-Ukrainian war. We all know that the war is generating severe human costs with far-reaching global impacts uh, from food to energy security. Uh, and the biggest challenges may yet well still be to come. The war is triggering a decoupling of Russia from the international system and a rewiring of relationships on the political and economic fronts. Russia is now facing the most radical sanctions regime in modern history, and the world is feeling the ripple effects. The conflict's also deepening cleavages between the North and South and between the East and West, and I can say this from the vantage point of, of living part of my life in Brazil. It's already, I've already mentioned the threat of potential escalation. I think maps can help us understand a little bit of Russia's strategic and geographic dilemmas, but also some of its calculations. We can start imputing some of Russia's motives, including the scramble for hydrocarbons and critical minerals. You see, Ukraine is not just an agricultural, but it's also a mineral superpower. This map, which I designed earlier this year, and parts of which uh, were inspired by Terra Cognita, show over 9,000 known critical mineral deposits spread across Ukraine. And it turns out that Donbass and Crimea are literal and metaphorical gold mines. Today, Russia occupies about 20% of all Ukraine's reserves of oil, gas, coal, rare earths, and other key minerals for the great green energy transition. The estimated value of those occupied resources in that area of light gray is in the order of $15 trillion in today's prices. Next slide, please. The second shock uh, that we allude to in the book and that I just want to reflect on here uh, relates to the deepening tensions between the U.S. and China, particularly over Taiwan. The potential for military miscalculation between these two giants is as high as it's ever been. We're seeing more and more spats over the South China Sea, and there are signals that China is also upgrading its conventional and nuclear arsenals. What's harder to see often is the massive integration between the US, Europe, and China, particularly on the technological and industrial fronts. And while there are major efforts right now to reduce many of these interdependencies, these linkages are likely playing a role in keeping war from breaking out. Maps like this one from the IISS, which is an interactive map, what you see here is a static version of it, help us understand this, the sheer scale of China's influence around the world. The map summarizes just some of the projects that make up one of China's biggest and most controversial foreign policy projects, the Belt and Road Initiative. What you see here, and if you were to zoom in, you'd see in, in Technicolor, are hundreds of Chinese-led investments in roads, bridges, ports, power generation facilities, 5G systems, fanning out across over 150 countries. If nothing else, it helps us understand the great wider game that's currently unfolding. Next slide, please. A third shock, which we discuss in the book, is the deceleration of hyperglobalization. This actually started after the 2008 financial crisis, but we saw the real slowdown beginning in 2020 in the wake of COVID-19. Lockdowns and supply chain disruptions exposed the brittleness of just-in-time production. And now the Ukraine-Russian war and U.S.-Channel rivalries are throwing sand into the gears of globalization. Globalization is transforming because of also because of resurgent populism, the acceleration of onshoring, friendshoring, and good old-fashioned protectionism. And this is bad news, because for all the downsides and negative externalities of globalization, it was and remains the biggest poverty reduction machine in history. What we're seeing here is, is the expansion of poverty and deepening of inequalities over the last couple of years. And this map shows how income inequality was distributed before the pandemic. With poverty and inequality now growing, we can expect to see major setbacks in our broader sustainable development goals, which the, globe, the world has set for itself. Next slide, please. The last and arguably most consequential shock is human-induced global warming. The last 10 years were scorching, and the planet is sailing past the 1.5 degree uh, Celsius threshold agreed in Paris in 2015. Global warming is not the only problem, of course, but it's linked to intersecting environmental and ecological crises. These challenges are most acute in the poorest parts of the world, precisely the areas that had the least to do with causing climate change in the first place. 
And a string of IPCC reports lay out a truly frightening scenario of rising temperatures, extreme weather, uh, catastrophic biodiversity loss, and between 200 and 1.2 billion people who could potentially be on the move uh, as a result of uh, climate migration or disaster displacement. Of course, climate change will also generate knock-on effects on all the other shocks from local, affecting local all the way to planetary stability. And these aren't problems just for, for the distant future. These are problems of today. And we have to make radical changes across the board if we want to survive this or the next century. I think maps can help us start to understand the ways in which a warming world will affect billions now and in the coming decades. Ian, I'll hand over to you for the next slide, please. Thank you very much, uh, Rob. It's been a huge pleasure to collaborate with you on this book. And I also would like to thank Ambassador Spaswasser, Alexander Reisenbichler, and of course, Doug, you for uh, facilitating the conversation. What we've aimed to do with this book is show how all these different great challenges intersect. Um, and by visualizing what's happening, we think that many people that find it difficult to plow through volumes and volumes of uh, material, books, and data, uh, will find a way of making sense of the world. And by making sense of it, finding how they can act, what they can do to make a difference. And although uh, these great challenges that Rob has outlined are overwhelming, and he's only named a few of them, uh, what's also re remarkable is that for each of them, there are extraordinary things happening. There are heroes in every country uh, who are making a difference, who are making inroads, who are showing at the local level, the community level, and sometimes even at the supranational level, how we can make a difference as individuals, uh, as organizations, if we get our act together. Amongst the many trends that uh, we depict are these political trends and this very uh, contradictory situation with some places becoming more demographic, the uh, robust and democratically so, and others uh, in decline. What's nice about uh, this particular graphic that you see, not least as we're being hosted uh, by the Canadian and German governments, is that both show up very well in terms of being more free. And indeed, that gives us the freedom uh, to expound many of these ideas. But much of the world has been in re regress uh, in recent years. And that is one of the most disturbing features. And of course, COVID-19 in this dimension, as in so many others, did accelerate the trends towards surveillance states, towards authoritarianism, uh, and for those that were suffering under totalitarian regimes, uh, things have tended to get worse. Next slide, please. One of the real positive stories of recent decades has been this extraordinary improvement in life expectancy. And what this visualization shows is two of the maps that we depict in Terra Incognita, comparing uh, a 40 year gap in just how much has been achieved. And it's these sorts of images that I think give one hope uh, that change does happen. It happens extremely quickly and it happens on multiple dimensions and improvements in life expectancy are amongst those. Uh, the yellow is the worst, less than 55 years uh, and the different degrees of uh, darker greens and shades of blue and purple are better. Again, it's good to see uh, that Germany and Canada have done particularly well, but many places have, and you see the fundamental changes around the world over this period of time. It's not only a rich country story. Uh, on average, people are living 20 to 25 years longer over this period of time. And uh, what's been amazing is how quickly this has happened. Over the last couple of centuries, life expectancy has tripled in the world, which is quite remarkable. Uh, and in some countries now is approaching an average of 90. Typically, uh, women survive two or three years longer than men because they're wiser than men, as I think all women know. They don't do as many stupid things. They don't stick knives into each other or drink alcohol or as much. Um, it, imbibe as much of bad things and they also don't drive as many fast cars into each other or into walls and so they live longer on average around the world so increasing gender imbalance in longevity also a gender imbalance 
in uh, fertility and how many kids in the gender balance of kids being born, more boys being born now, which is very disturbing trends. Some provinces of China, as we show, uh, 13 boys for every 10 girls uh, at the age of one, for example. But the overwhelming story is incredibly positive of aging. And of course, that raises many questions about what we do with it. In Canada, average life expectancy is about 82. In Germany, about 81, which is about typical for the OECD countries. Uh, but many developing countries showing remarkable progress in this. And also the biggest surprise, which we depict as well, is the collapse uh, in fertility around the world. That has been, the, to me, certainly the biggest surprise, and many developing countries. So Vietnam, for example, has a lower fertility rate now than Sweden. Uh, over half the countries in the world below replacement level, uh, only Africa left as the young continent. And within it, really only five countries uh, account for it. Next slide, please. What we also see as one of these mega trends is very, very rapid urbanization. Uh, with cities really accounting for a growing share of global GDP, of global economic activity, and the mega cities within it. So increasing concentration. You see that depicted in this slide, uh, which is a slide which depicts the economics of urbanization, how big these economies are and what the mega uh, cities are in terms of their contribution to national economies. If one depicts this as we do in the book in terms of population, uh, Africa uh, will be much more prominent. Well over half the world now urbanized, many countries 80, 90 percent plus uh, urban areas and urban areas being the big source of dynamism in the future. What goes along with urbanization, and I know Doug you've written about this, uh, as well as the population uh, aging and fertility declines, of course, is the impetus for migration. One dimension is rural urban migration that's been accelerated by climate change in many parts of the developing world where rural options are being diminished, conflict uh, and other risks also accelerate that urbanization trend. But uh, urban areas are also particularly vulnerable to climate change. And we depict that in the book and show images of how, for our example, under where we seem to be heading now, which is two degrees plus of global warming, Miami will be underwater, Jakarta underwater, um, and many, many other cities. So this growing tension between people being forced into cities, but cities also very vulnerable. One of the stories we tell in the book and this is very much drawing on Rob's experience, uh, is how vibrant cities can be as well in building resilience and helping uh, to counter these trends. Migration, a key theme of the book as well, uh, both Canada and Germany have been extraordinarily successful in absorbing migrants, particularly Canada, 21% uh, of the population, Canadians know about the importance of this and our lesson, provide a lesson to the world. And of course, one of the connections between migration and urbanization, which we also depict in the book, is that the most successful cities, which always come out highest in the ranking of where people want to live, are those with the highest share of population. In Canada, it's Toronto and Vancouver, uh, which come out very high, very high share uh, migrant, but also this is true in Germany uh, as well. Germany very successfully absorbing the million or so refugees. And we have in the book many graphics which show these refugee movements and the importance for them, of course, the German economy, particularly with rapid aging, now also increasingly dependent on absorbing migrants every year. Next slide, please. The digital transformation is another mega trend which we can feel incredibly optimistic about, although sometimes social media and the silos that have been created are a source of growing concern. And here, in the, the way that we do similarly uh, with many other trends in the book, we compare how just how rapidly things have transformed around the world. This is comparing in the top panel uh, 2008, 2000 data with 2018 data in the bottom panel. Again, highlighting this extraordinary story of virtually nowhere in the world. Again, Canada and Germany, very good examples ahead of the curve on internet access 
Um, you see in the 2000s, amongst the few countries in the world that were approaching well over half the population having internet access. Uh, to a situation now where much of the world has, and, and just really a few countries in Africa who still have very low penetration levels. The digital divide is something that we talk about, not only between countries, but within countries, and the importance of this now, uh, whether one can be an effective citizen or effective competitor in the world, effective player in the world without this a big theme uh, of the book. Next slide, please. Climate change, uh, Rob has already talked about this, Ambassador um, Spava so also did, <laughs> while we talk, people are negotiating uh, in Sharm el-Sheikh uh, on COP27. I think we don't need any convincing of the scale of this, but we have many graphics in the book uh, which depict how rapidly this has changed and what the likely impact of extreme weather is. Uh, we have images which show that it's likely to account for three, four, five times the mortality that crime does uh, in many places, the impact of pollution, etc., and how it's likely to impact on agricultural systems, but also on urban systems. The book in this as in every way, it's not a book of despair. It's a book of hope. It's a book of which is seeking to rally for change, to show what can be done. And so we do have many examples of how places are building resilience, how we can engage in adaptation, uh, what we can do about it. Of course, the main thing we need to do is an energy transition. Uh, next slide, please. This is uh, a slide of the green energy transition in the USA. Uh, a very encouraging slide, uh, and this was uh, from 2021. We contrast it with earlier periods in the US, and we show through zooming in on particular states how uh, subsidies and taxes can make a real difference to the rates of adoption of wind, uh, solar, and renewable energies. This is an, a story which really demonstrates the effectiveness but also how prices are making a difference. We know at the moment, uh, due to the energy crisis, that there's been a, a great uptick, both in um, the, the, the coal sands of Canada, but also in the US in fracking uh, and others in older energy forms. But this is an, a story which is really one of optimism and shows just how quickly uh, not only is uh, renewable energy being adopted, but in the slides that we uh, have in the book also how quickly the price is falling, the exponential declines, particularly in wind and solar, and already much more competitive than other forms of energy. Next slide, please. The education revolution is another source of enormous uh, positive impact around the world. We all know uh, that education is at the heart of the transformation of societies for political engagement, for enabling citizens to be effective citizens, but improving their health, but also improving their economic outcomes, and of course, leading to very rapid declines in fertility. This is a, a depiction of comparing 1950 to 27, so a 67 year gap. And you just see this extraordinary story of improvements. Only one country in the world left really Niger, where you have a very, very low levels of uh, engagement uh, in education. Of course, there, we have other graphics that show the gender differentiation about this, many more boys than girls still being educated. But this is a story of optimism as well. Uh, Germany and the US, as well as others, having improved. So we see even uh, for, for the wealthier countries like Canada and Germany, real progress in moving towards uh, full education for people. And of course, we also have graphics that show uh, tertiary education and other forms of, of learning. Next graphic, please. The overall point that's been made um, by Rob is of our hyper-connected world, uh, the importance of maintaining this and this is just an image which we play out in different ways in the book of how this level of interconnectedness uh, has developed. The fiber that joins us, the pipelines that join us, satellite linkages that join us, the trade linkages that join us. There's no wall high enough 
which would allow any country to progress on its own, even the mightiest countries like China and the US uh, absolutely are interdependent with the world. In fact, the bigger they are, as you see uh, in this graphic very visually, the more interdependent they are. Uh, and China, of course, a big beneficiary of globalization, as is the US. We define globalization as these flows of all forms, including digital and people across national borders. And so the great challenge we face is as we enter this more and more complex world, more and more interconnected world, is the divide between what we see as the reality and the politics of fragmentation. The, the fact that we're stuck in a largely Westphalian model of politics, where the system seems not to be in harmony, uh, the political system, with the reality of our deep interconnectedness. And this is not only an interconnectedness of economic structures, as depicted here, but also, more importantly, of course, to manage the risks. We've seen that with COVID, uh, which we, we, <laughs> we finished the book during COVID. We have some images of that. And we see it, of course, starkly now with climate change. So the great risk that we point to in our concluding chapter is the risk of political fragmentation, rising tensions between the US and China. Obviously, uh, Russia remains a big risk. And what we point to in the book is ways to navigate this, not only the will to overcome them, but also the fact that coalitions of the working can solve most problems, that some countries and some cities and states, as well as civil society and businesses, can make an enormous difference, and that we cannot wait for the global political community to sort itself out to address problems. This is a call for action. It's a call for action for all players, starting with ourselves, with the institutions we're part of, uh, to be able to address them. And we're very optimistic in the world that if individuals act, we can overcome this inertia of political fragmentation that appears to be getting worse since we wrote the book, Not Better. So we hope the book inspires people. We hope the book serves its purpose, which to, is to clarify the facts, to clarify what's been achieved and point to what we still need to achieve. And we thank very much uh, Monk, together with the German and Canadian governments um, and our hosts for allowing us to present it to you. Thank you. I think over to you, Doug. Thank you, uh, Robert and Ian, for sharing uh, just a few of the uh, extraordinary, mind-blowing images that, that fill this book and providing a little bit of context uh, around them. I should say to those of you uh, attending this webinar, if you wish to participate in this conversation, please feel free to enter any uh, uh, questions you have in the Q&A uh, uh, tab, and uh, I'll, I'll certainly make my best effort to uh, include them in this conversation. I, uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of things that I'd like to hear from you about. Um, Let's start with let's start with the mega -est of uh, of mega trends in this book, which which is the which is globalization and and specifically the end of globalization, if you if you'd call it that. A lot of what you chronicle in this book is the rise of various forms of interconnectedness that have that have kind of ended national trends and made many of the developments around the world uh, uh, very international across wide geographies at the same time. Um, but a lot of the economic forces and political forces that we lumped together as globalization have been on the decline. Um, I think another book that a lot of us have been reading with fascination this year is Sludging Towards the Utopia by the economic historian Brad DeLong, in which he fairly persuasively makes the case that the age of globalization lasted from the 1870s to, uh, I think he puts the end date at 2010, uh, after the 2008 uh, crisis. And I mean, as I see it, and certainly as I take it from what you've chronicled, there's both positive and negative reasons for globalization declining. The positive reason is that it created uh, benefits. It, it ended international inequality to a large degree. Um, to the extent that we no longer have very many countries that are extremely low labor cost 
countries anymore. Over the last 30 or 40 years, uh, absolute poverty went from being a, something like 40% of humanity to a very small sliver. And, uh, and, and a lot of other things increased to the point that, uh, that a lot of countries are happy to be semi-middle class, uh, a bit more autonomous countries. But of course, also we've seen, as you know, the rise of nationalism, um, authoritarianism, protectionism uh, and uh, and and the possibility that we now have a world divided into a liberal block and uh, and a more authoritarian block who may trade within each other's uh, circles but uh, a pulling back of of the trade links and the political links that governed that period uh, from 1870 to 2010 or whenever you want to put it maybe it's maybe the end is still in the future. So let me put it to, to both of you. Um, do you see globalization as a thing in the past? Uh, do we have a way to rescue it? And, uh, and what are the consequences of the, these changes to global links? Shall I go first? I think so. As Professor of Globalization, <laughs> I think the floor is yours. All right. Um, let, let me just cut to the chase. Uh, is globalization dead? No. Um, and uh, it depends how you define it. For me, the definition of globalization is flows across national borders of goods, of things, of did, as well as of uh, uh, bits, of digital traffic, people, investment, ideas, etc. Uh, and we've become actually more interdependent uh, than ever because of, for example, the energy crisis and the food crisis, which are illustrating our need for interdependence. Uh, I think there's two or three things happening in the background, which will mean that certain aspects of globalization do decline. The one is technological progress. Machines can basically, in automation, do what humans used to do at much cheaper cost. So anything in manufacturing, like to for low cost locations, you get increasingly robotics and automation will do that. And for services, the idea of having back offices in Bangalore or call centers in the Philippines is a very 20th century idea. Um, so those things will disappear uh, naturally. And that means that we have a massive relocation of capital, of machines to the rich countries and closer to the big markets and a, a reduction in the labor saving outsourcing processes. I don't think it's for the reason, Doug, that you said, which is everywhere is rich now and we've overcome inequality. If only that, that would be in my dreams. Uh, inequality has actually grown vastly uh, and been accelerated by the pandemic. We're living through the biggest development disaster in history. More people are being forced back into absolute poverty more quickly than ever before. And one of the tragedies of globalization is there's no solidarity. The SDGs have been totally uh, derailed um, and, the, and Africa's poorer than it has been most probably any time in the last 20 years. So people desperately need jobs in low cost uh, locations and they are low cost they're a tiny fraction of the wages paid in the rich countries but they're not going to get them because of technological change uh, the second big change is the transformation of our economies as we get richer we have less and less things that we import and we increasingly have services so you don't buy more and more fridges more and more cars more and more clothes etc and you don't even buy more and more food you just buy more and more what economists call non-tradables better quality food from a better quality restaurant. Mass we go from manufacturing to massages and you don't trade massages uh, remotely. And that transformation is happening in all the rich countries and it's happening in China big time. You've basically reached a threshold and where you don't buy and trade more things. So that's also very, very important, the transformation. And the third point I'd make is that inequality has been exacerbated by globalization. I think it did lead to a rise in inequality in the US, in Europe and elsewhere, as low cost jobs were moved offshore. And that's, that's led to higher um, populism and nationalism. That's not, that is gonna be a permanent trend. The crises have exacerbated that, the pandemic, the climate, the war in Ukraine, people, the extremes are growing and that means populism is gonna grow. We'll see it in the midterms in the US today. Uh, and with that, 
I think we will see increasing nationalism. That's not going to derail globalization either. What it is going to de uh, derail is solving global problems. That leads us into a vicious spiral. More and more uh, populism, more and more nationalism, less capability to solve global problems, more and more inequality and risk. In that world, people want to deglobalize, but actually are more and more affected by the by global forces. And so we have this, this real tension between the real world of globalization and the politics of it. Uh, and that's, I think, what partly what we're trying to resolve in the book. No, the, the only thing I'd add, I think, is that perhaps, and I, I agree broadly with, with Ian's um, thesis, and I, I think it's, we discussed this issue about the deceleration of globalization in, in the latter parts of the book, is that this combined, this, the combined forces of automation, uh, of, of economic or structural shifts, um, and then this paradox of declining global cooperation um, are contributing to a slowdown of maybe the era of unbridled hyper-globalization, deregulated globalization, um, and that, you know, we're going to be seeing a slowdown. But I think the idea that globalization is finished, if it's defined as the sharing of ideas, people, capital, I think is perhaps maybe a step too far. One of the, I guess, point that I was just going to allude to that, that, that we raise in the book are you know, that we need to look at globalization in a relatively nuanced way, both looking at the upsides of globalization, which I think you can walk through in terms of those big mega trends, or at least some of the upsides, improvements in health, longevity, increased education, reductions, major reductions, extraordinary reductions, unparalleled reductions in poverty, um, reductions in inequality, all of which I think we're seeing some, some challenges on over the last couple of years. But we also, I think, perhaps neglected the, the downsides of globalization uh, and to our peril. And I think the book goes into some detail to describe some of these downsides, whether it's digital harms from that emerged from this extraordinary digital transformation that we're undergoing, um, whether it's the environmental externalities, uh, which were not cost into our models for this unbridled economic development, whether it's deepening polarization um, from cooperation or international cooperation that perhaps uh, went too quickly or more quickly than many people would and some people would have would have desired and, and the, the ability of of, of uh, canny politicians to to capture that resentment um so i think it's it's having trying to understand both the upside uh, and the downsides and i think the challenge for many of us is how do we minimize those downsides to globalization and i think that starts with becoming aware of them and chronicling them and mapping them and so the book goes some distance to trying to explain that um literally in in, in technicolor Yes, thank you both for that. Um, I, sh I should stress, I was not, I was not uh, suggesting that inequality had declined within specific countries. There certainly are some countries that have seen uh, the declining inequality reverse itself. But between yeah. between countries, the, the 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 inequality between international inequality has has collapsed uh, quite a bit over the last five decades or so. So so that the idea that there are that that. Uh, uh, um, there are very, very different gaps between countries in terms of uh, average income and so on uh, has declined quite a bit. It's a, a, there's a much larger middle class. Um, it would be remiss uh, not to talk about the climate crisis, uh, speaking as we are during uh, the uh, a, a very ineffective seeming COP meeting going on at the moment, perhaps uh, uh, made more difficult by some of the schisms that you've discussed uh but also also a time when there's a lot going on as far as finally starting to fund climate solutions and so on so your book illustrates rather gravely many of the consequences of a of a, a, a warming planet of uh rising ocean levels uh and so on um and also the gaps between solutions and realities as far as how electricity is generated uh how transportation is fueled uh and and these sorts of things and certainly uh our use of energy to provide heat electricity and transportation is the linchpin uh of any solution now we've seen uh we've seen some very large initiatives the united states government has put an astonishing amount of funding into green, green transition. China claims that it has, although it's 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 hard to measure what's going on the ground. And we're starting to see new Green New Deal 
type initiatives begin to happen in spite of, uh, of, of the division of the world. Um, Robert, as you pointed out, a lot of this green transition paradoxically, it, I mean, the one thing we've learned in the last 10 years, I think, is that, is that the transition to a carbon neutral world is going to be extremely expensive. It'll require a lot of economic growth to make it possible. Um, it will rely on a lot of minerals that are themselves problematic and both politically and ecologically. It'll re probably rely on a lot of infra infrastructure made of concrete that uh, that is e ecologically difficult to use. Certainly building the types of uh, ocean level barriers that we see in, in the Netherlands and Venice and London around Miami and uh, Singapore and so on, it could itself be uh, a contributor to the climate crisis. So let, let me put it to you broadly. Um, are we going to be able to square the circle uh, in terms of, 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 build, of building climate solutions that will bring us to a carbon neutral world without further exacerbating that problem through those solutions themselves? It's probably the question, um, I think, and, and one that I, I think a whole other book uh, needs to be devoted, many books need to be devoted to. Um, I am sort of guardedly, uh, I, I'm, I'm challenged by the enormity of the task and the scale and, and the scope of the ambition that's required. Um, and, and concerned about the distressing lack of international cooperation that Ian alluded to, um, which are themselves, you know, a, a consequence of, or at least connected to this rampant runaway globalization uh, and all of the pernicious outcomes. On the other hand, you know, I think we also are in the midst of a green tipping point of sorts. Um, the, the, over the last five to 10 years, I, I think we've seen a real uh, shift in public opinion certainly in, in most OECD countries and increasingly uh, you know, around the world, about the nature of the crisis, the severity of the crisis. Our science is getting better and better as subsequent IPCC reports are showing. Our simulations are getting better and better. Uh, the precision, um, uh, you know, I think, uh, around our, our estimates um, are becoming uh, stronger. Um, and, and I think the awareness of what needs to be done around mitigation adaptation is, is, is also clear. And accompanying that, I mean, yes, we have the stop-start COP negotiations, but we have a, a major shift in the investment world or, and, and finance around um, sort of investing, impact investing, and notwithstanding the controversies around ESG in the States, a growing recognition that we need to have greener solutions. Uh, and, and a lot of, I think, collaboration happening outside of the halls of the UN uh, to try to generate solutions um, around this. And, and accompanying all of that, of course, is the drop, this extraordinary drop in prices for renewables as, as more of these products come online, especially in photovoltaics, but also in wind and, and hydro. So, you know, accompanying that, I think, or maybe a function of that has been those three or four uh, major moves you described, Doug, the IRA most recently uh, the Inflation Reduction Act in the United States, which is a 350 billion plus initiative, um, which includes, among other things, investing, not enough, but investing in, in greener infrastructure. The Use Green Deal, uh, which has a rather extraordinary impact beyond the Europe, European Union, of course, the Brussels effect extends far beyond when it starts investing in, in green. Uh, China, which, yes, hard to see, but also is making major investments, frankly, out of necessity um, and has an ability to make step changes fairly quickly, though its consumption of carbon and coal in particular has increased in the last couple of years rather than decreased. Um, but we also see, I think, beyond the big states, we see cities stepping up. And Doug, I know you've written about this as well, but there are hundreds of city networks, including some with thousands of members who are committing themselves to a green transition, getting neutral uh, to by 2030 or, or, or the latest 2050. Um, and we're seeing a lot of really fascinating plays uh, around transition of their electricity grids, around investing in, in EVs or other uh, micro-mobility solutions, mass investments in nature-based solutions, uh, trying to avoid the concrete problem or the concrete bias he described. Um, so, so I think that, you know, on the one hand, yes, the, the challenges are tremendous in scope and scale. On the other hand, um, we're starting to see, I think, this tipping point taking place um, and it needs to be accelerated. And I think the idea that somehow climate change is, is, is um, you know, doesn't exist, I think the skeptics are increasingly uh, fewer and fewer, even though I think disinformation in that area continues to be a very serious challenge that we have to confront uh, full on. 
There is this paradox though, right, that you alluded to, which is that in order to generate the green transition at the scale that's being set out in the IRA or the European uh, New Deal, um, we need the critical minerals and the rare earths and all of the accompanying technologies to drive that. And how do we do that? Well, we have to get our supply chains organized. And it turns out that actually we're not there. Uh, we're not even close to there yet when it comes to uh, this great scramble or race that's underway right now uh, to generate the, the underlying technologies, the underlying refinement of the products and the raw materials themselves to drive this transition. Um, and so what we're seeing right now, I think, and I've described this in a Global Mail article a couple of months ago, is a kind of great game that's emerging uh, between many of these major blocks uh, as they scramble to secure those core resources. China is far ahead in, in this race, uh, having um, sort of in some ways already made great advances on the technology front in terms of developing the applications, the, the tools, the magnets, the cathodes, the, the panels, the voltaics that are going to drive the the cars that are going to drive this revolution. Um, they've also made major strides in terms of refinement around the, the, the you know, 30 to 40 to 50 critical minerals that are essential to drive uh, the production of these technologies. And they've made major inroads in places like Africa, also, of course, in Asia, and even in Latin America, and frankly, in, in North America, in terms of securing or procuring the raw materials that are going to drive it. I think what we're seeing right now is Europe and the United States and Canada, in a way, waking up. Uh, to the fact that they set out these big, broad commitments, but don't have nearly uh, the supply chain organization that the you know the, the, the China does, and so that what we're seeing right now is a a, a rapid race <laughs> uh, amongst these countries to form alliances, multilateral and bilateral, uh, to try to create uh, sort of more organ predictability and cooperation across their supply chains. Um, we have to do a lot very quickly if we're going to meet even the minimum commitments that are being set out in the COPs, for example, COP 27 and COP 15 that will happen in Montreal in a couple of uh, next month. Um, the other, of course, uh, potentially dangerous outcome of all this, this race, to, not, not, is not just a geopolitical competition that's emerging, but also, of course, the potentially devastating impacts ecologically and environmentally in areas where, we're, where extraction is going to take place. Uh, many people will know about the ravaging of the, 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 the Democratic Republic of Congo in pursuit of cobalt and Colton and, and all of and copper and all of the other associated minerals that are generating not just geopolitical tensions, but also generating enormous ecological devastation. Um, another concern we have right now is the Amazon, which actually has one of the largest deposits of rare earths uh, known um, and have yet to be exploited. A risk there as we look to kind of generate this transition is that we actually cause another challenge, which is accelerating more deforestation in a part of the world that already has record level deforestation. And the list goes on. So I think as we, we think about this green transition and we focus perhaps uh, hopefully on all of the new technologies that will enable this to take place from the, the, the panels to the electric cars, we also be mindful of, again, those negative externalities that are potentially consequence of it. Um, and, and this is a real issue that I don't think has been fully, fully thought through yet. Ian, you may have some additional comments. Um, let, I see there's quite a few questions in the Q and A, so um, I think you've answered that brilliantly. Let's uh, let's move on. <laughs> yes, and th thanks to the audience members uh, uh, who who built upon what you've been saying um, with some thoughts on how to elaborate on these solutions, how to how to bridge the gap between the, uh, the, the ecological, economic, and, and material challenges that we face and the political realities behind them. Let me, let me read you from two questions from audience members that I think uh, are interlinked and speak to each other. One from Lucas Towns, who asks, how should the Western liberal democratic states balance the need for global cooperation to tackle the numerous crises we collectively face without risking legitimizing the authoritarian regimes will inevitably need to be part of the solution. And uh, Ralph, uh, Ralph Ostervolt uh, similarly asks, how would you solve your identified problem of short-termism of governments, as you say, given current bruised uh, or broken democracy uh, with, uh, with, with the, with the non-proportional electoral systems in places like uh, uh, United States uh, and, and, and UK? So they're, they're, they're both asking, given, given the divisions in how the world selects its leaders and uh, uh, or whether it has the ability to um, 
can we can we find solutions that uh, as the first question asks don't involve legitimizing these powers uh allowing allowing conquest and uh domination not not only of peoples but of uh, uh, neighboring countries to be legitimized maybe i'll start with that and and um i'm sure rob will have lots to add uh i think we need to be very clear what the problem is that we tackling uh for most problems that we can think of in the world, there's no solution without the US and China being in the room. Uh, and I never thought I would say this in my lifetime again, but I wish that Kissinger was back in the White House. In other words, uh, someone that understands the concept of frenemies, someone that understands the concept that you might not like them and you might have fundamental disagreements on many areas, but that you need to work together for the sake of the world and for your own sake. Uh, for the sake of your economy, uh, and he was absolutely right in going to China and uh, engaging in conversations uh, with a very authoritarian regime then, uh, and opening, being part of the process of opening up China. Uh, I cannot see a solution to climate change, to stopping pandemics, or to anything significant in the world without the China and the US being at the table. Uh, and so I think one has to acknowledge that one's common interest uh, is greater than whatever disagreements one might have without bearing those disagreements, without not talking about the things that you disagree on. Uh, but I, I do see it as where I also think for the future of globalization, however you define it, uh, both China and the US are the biggest beneficiaries. Uh, the US is much, much stronger today as a result of China opening up over the last 30 years. And certainly China is in a very, a very, very different place to what it would have been to both of their immense benefit. And that's true of the world as well. Now, this is not the same as saying that you need to not have sanctions against Russia at the moment, um, for example. Or well, in my country, South Africa, I was a very strong supporter of sanctions against the totalitarian regime in South Africa during the apartheid era. These are different things. Uh, because the countries that, uh, and I think one needs to be selective about which countries one's engaging with. Just to, uh, and I, and we do at times have to engage with people that we might not like. Uh, depends on what the issues are. This this is a bridge to to Ralph's uh, question. I coalitions of cities, of states, of businesses, uh, and of some countries can go ninety percent of the way to solving most of uh, the world's problems. And the idea that you need all countries to agree everything, in other words, the, the concept of global governance, meaning everyone in the world, is actually an idea which really only, I think, is totally applicable to pandemics, which can come from anywhere in the world. Uh, but virtually every other problem, a small, like a dozen or maybe even less countries account for 90% of the problem. That's certainly true of climate change. Uh, of course, those affected need to be there too, to give legitimacy. And my sense is that we need to find ways, and Canada and Germany are absolutely central to this, of countries that care, that countries have the savvy, that countries that can build coalitions and that understand that it's not only about state actors, but non-state actors as well, of moving towards solving uh, big global challenges. Uh, by doing that, I think one gets over the problem that we don't have a good global governance system. The UN is not going to solve the problem, therefore we have to give up. And what the book shows is numerous examples where this has made a fundamental difference to outcomes in the world uh, over the last 50 years. And I believe it can in the future. And I'm, that's how I reconcile uh, the short termism with problem solving. There are many governments that are not short term and within governments, there are also very different interests. Some are much long term, but there are many actors as well uh, who are long term and we need to work with them much more aggressively. Rob, do you want to come in on this? <laughs> no, I, I think you've really captured it well. I mean, I think there, there's a conundrum at the center of, or at least connected to these two questions, which is the role of, of uh, supranational institutions or multilateral institutions like the UN, the Bretton Woods, um, which are undergoing, um, I, I would say, a, you know, a, a moment of, of um, reconsideration, rethinking again. Uh, and, and, you know, the, the challenge, I, I think the UN Security Council as a governing body and the UN General Assembly, Ian, speaking to your point about one, one country, one vote, um, 
are on the one hand paralyzed and and um, dysfunctional um, on the other hand are are maybe inadequate to address the complexity and systemic nature uh, of the challenges we're facing um, and so that's not to say that you know we do away with the UN it's just there's gonna be a, a lot of reflection on the future of the UN including at a summit of the future that will be happening in 2024 to to think about how the UN rebuilds itself and renews itself but I think that the point here is that uh, we need to start with the problems and defining them clearly as you've said uh, and think about the multiple ways in which cooperation is possible and already ongoing I mean beginning with US China um, cooperating on on areas where there's pragmatic agreement and also shared interests but also thinking about other forms of network multilateralism uh, that again are problem oriented and re require multiple configurations of actors or south-south cooperation an idea that emerged about 20 30 years ago and which might find new license or new life uh, as other states outside of the western perimeter start engaging on on consequential problems collectively as well in pragmatic ways and then finally I think city networks um, offer really interesting opportunities for scale and, and legitimacy at a time when there is this backlash against global governance um, and you know I think cities are where democracy was born cities are where people feel it most tangibly and there's a role here for education and awareness about the importance of engaging on some of these issues uh, these global issues at a period of retrenchment and revanchism um, and reactionaryism that we're seeing uh, in, in many countries in the world so I think that there are there's an abundance of possibilities for collaboration within the constraints of the nation-state uh, system and the opportunity space of democracies that uh, that we can start exploiting and giving uh, more more visibility to thank you uh to both of you for that I, I you know I I think we just have time to fit in one last question and it builds on what you were just saying Robert um about the need for city coalitions um of course this is rather my own selfish interest I've I've specialized in looking at urbanization as a solution uh to both ecological and socioeconomic disparities um and we have a good question from Brian Ray which we have about five minutes to answer so you won't be able to do it fully justice he asks you clearly demonstrate through the maps the importance of urbanization as a process on a global scale given urbanization how would you visualize cities that lead in terms of green infrastructure and technology what uh, data would you use to represent this kind of transition on a global scale go ahead Rob it's a big question um but I like it uh I, you know the first thing I, <laughs> I see why you chose that one Doug first thing I'd say is is uh you know we go in the book we describe at some length sort of the history of, of of urbanization and some projections looking into the future and I think it's interesting just as a very broad point to start answering that question by simply saying well where's urbanization going to be taking place according to UN population statistics that, that we we currently rely on as well as other statistics are being generated generated out of the European Union uh and and research centers around the world including in Canada and Germany um, well, the reality is that most future urbanization, that is to say that the broad movement of people from rural to urban areas and the swelling of new cities is going to be taking place in really two parts of the world, in, in Asia and Africa. For the most part, the Americas and um, other parts of the OECD have already gone through, in a way, their urban transition. And, and about 90, we estimate 90% of future urbanization is going to be taking place uh, in those parts of the world that have not yet gone through their full urban transition. It stands to reason. In fact, China, India, and Nigeria will account for about 40 to 50% of all uh, future urbanization um, that we, we, we know about and the building of large new cities. So I think that we have to understand a little bit about where the center of gravity is when it comes to the 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 future trends in terms of the growth of, of cities around the world um and I would answer the question sort of in two ways uh one I'd say that future cities should not be built along using the same models as uh western or past cities um you know uh we do not want to be building cities that are sprawling that are decentralized that are concrete dependent that are car dependent um you know that that have um you know that, that are that are squandering resources that are not built densely so there's there's a whole set of principles and practices that we ought to be thinking about in the building of our future cities that much that must be much more focused on uh in more intelligent design uh more mixed use uh prop you know, zoning uh more investment in, in greener materials uh you know, much more emphasis on micro mobility and, and non-car based solutions uh etc cetera, etc cetera, you know, greener energy grids uh etc and I think that 
you know, it's, it's absolutely critical that as we think about the 60 to 70% of the world's urban infrastructure that has to be built in the next 20 or 30 years to accommodate this urban transition in the global south, that the, the right planning principles and zoning uh, concepts and in, investments are being made. Because the real risk here is that we redesign systems like we did in the past. The second point I think I'd raise is that for the rest of the, of, of certainly the developed world, um, and the more advanced economies, there's a lot we need to do to retrofit our cities and green our cities. And we're starting to see that happening. There, uh, I already mentioned um, a number of city networks, uh, but city networks like the C40, ICLE, um, you know, the, the Global Covenant uh, uh, of, 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 of mayors, um, which bring together tens of, like literally over 10,000, 11,000 cities, are already uh, making calls for smarter solutions around greening cities and investing in in greener solutions at the city scale. And we're seeing cities in certainly in Western Europe, including in Germany and elsewhere, um, starting to, to, well, being in position to be able to hit the net zero targets uh, that are so urgently needed within the next 10, 15, 20 years. So we see this happening much more rapidly at the city level than we do often at the, na at the nation scale. So I think that there, there are two challenges here. One about how do we build the cities of tomorrow in a way that is green and doesn't emulate the past. And the second is how do we retrofit and upgrade uh, and green our existing cities and infrastructures, uh, emphasizing you know a, a more biophilic green nature-based solutions so that they don't contribute uh, to greenhouse gas emissions. And there's, I mean, two statistics that really stand out in this. One of which is, is that cities uh, consume uh, globally about 75% of our energy. So that is, a huge factor when it comes to thinking about, um, you know, mitigation of uh, greenhouse gases. Uh, and they generate about 80% of those greenhouse gases from carbon dioxide through to nitrogen dioxide uh, and the rest. So cities are a really important both challenge, um, you know, to our hitting our broader climate objective set out by Paris, uh, but they're also critical solutions uh, and sources of innovation and laboratories for testing new ideas. Uh, that can get us to hit those targets. Ian. Yeah, no, no, I, I think you've said enough and we need to end. That was good. Thank you to both of you for that. I, I wish we could uh, continue for, you know, another six hours or so. And, uh, but I would urge those uh, attending to, uh, to get a copy of Terra Incognita because it really does provide what you've received, just a small sample of through this dialogue today, which I would summarize as, as a sense of scale um, by shifting these previously abstract and statistical problems into a cartographic visual reality, what this work does is provide a sense of scale, not just the spatial scale, not just, not just the extent to which things cover the globe and certain parts of the globe, but also a very wide temporal scale. Uh, it, it, it gives a sense of how things have changed over decades and centuries and how they are poised to change uh, now and in the immediate future, uh, depending on the solutions we made. Um, and the book provides a lesson, I think, and I think our dialogue has provided a lesson about the nature of scale, that there's a real danger in focusing on too small a scale. As you write in your conclusion, uncoordinated responses within countries and between countries compound our problems and are bound to fail. Uh, what is required is closer, closer collaboration to overcome our shared trials. So uh, if anything, what's come out of this is, is a sense that those maps that show a lot of dotted lines between countries, we need, we need a lot more dotted lines and solid lines uh, joining them. We need a much larger sense of scale, both in space and time and in, and in, and in expenditure and, and effort and commitment uh, on our behalf. So I thank you for leaving us with this lesson. Thank you to, uh, to the uh, German embassy in Canada, to the uh, CERES program at, uh, at uh, Monk School, and thank you, of course, to Ian and Robert for for providing us this wonderful work. And, and thanks uh, thank to you, everybody. Doug, for your for your great sharing and um, and to everyone that's been involved. Really appreciate it. Likewise. It was a great pleasure, and I hope it was a pleasure for everybody attending today. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Take care. Take care.